Welcome to the FAA's virtual public workshop on the LaGuardia Airport Access Improvement Project Draft Environmental Impact Statement, or EIS. The EIS has been prepared by the FAA to evaluate the Port Authority of New York and New Jersey's proposed project. My name is Evelyn Martinez, and I am the manager of the FAA's New York Airports District Office located in Jamaica, Queens. I am part of the FAA team working on the draft EIS. First, I wanna take this opportunity to thank you for taking the time out of your busy schedules to learn about the Port Authority's proposed project and the FAA's environmental review. The FAA especially appreciates your participation via this virtual format due to the ongoing public health emergency associated with COVID-19. We hope that this format will allow us to reach as many interested people as possible in the absence of in-person meetings. During this workshop, the FAA will give you an overview of the Port Authority's proposed project and the draft EIS. The FAA is conducting the environmental review because the Port Authority plans to use the FAA Passenger Facility Charge or PFC program to provide a portion of the funding for the project. This project is considered a major federal action, which means the FAA must follow the National Environmental Policy Act or NEPA and the Council on Environmental Quality Regulations. Commonly referred to as the LaGuardia Air Train, the LaGuardia Airport Access Improvement Project is a proposal by the Port Authority to provide an automated people mover system between LaGuardia Airport and New York Public Transportation Systems. The FAA will issue a record of decision only after FAA has had the opportunity to review public and agency comments on the draft EIS. The draft EIS identifies the purpose and need for the proposed action, reasonable alternatives, and evaluates the potential environmental impacts that may result from the proposed action and the no action alternative. Pursuant to the New York State Eminent Domain Procedure Law, the draft EIS also discloses the real property transactions proposed by the Port Authority. The FAA also invited cooperating agencies in preparation of the draft EIS, which include U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, U.S. Environmental Protection Agency, New York State Department of Environmental Conservation, New York State Department of Transportation, and New York State Office of Parks, Recreation, and Historic Preservation. The draft EIS was published on August 21, 2020 for a 45-day public comment period. The FAA is holding two virtual public workshops and three virtual public hearings on the draft EIS. We encourage you to submit your comments to the FAA on the draft EIS. You can get more information, register for additional hearings or workshops, or submit a formal comment at the project website www.lgaaccesseis.com. All formal comments are due to FAA by 5 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time on Monday, October 5th, 2020. During the questions and answer portion of this workshop, questions can be submitted by clicking on the questions and answers tab on Zoom or the link provided on FAA's Facebook and YouTube channels. You can also text us your questions at 301-531-5996. Next, Andrew Brooks and Marie Janae with our FAA EIS team will give you a general overview of the draft EIS. Detailed information, including the full draft EIS and supporting documents are also available on the project website, www.lgaaccesseis.com. Thank you for participating in the draft EIS review process. My name is Marie Janae, and I am an Environmental Protection Specialist with the FAA's New York Airports District Office. For the next portion of the workshop, Andrew Brooks, the FAA Eastern Region Environmental Program Manager, and I, as Project Managers for the FAA EIS team, will provide you with an overview of the proposed project and the draft EIS. You can find more in-depth information on the draft EIS at the project website www.lgaaccesseis.com. 
The Port Authority of New York and New Jersey, as the airport sponsor, is proposing the LaGuardia Airport Access Improvement Project to address unpredictable and increasing travel times to and from LaGuardia, while also addressing space constraints for employee parking. The purpose of the project is to provide a time-certain transportation option that connects airport passengers and employees to and from LaGuardia, while also addressing space constraints for employee parking. To satisfy the purpose of and need for the project, the Port Authority is proposing to construct and operate a new Automated People Mover System, or APM, to provide a reliable transit alternative for air passengers and employees at LaGuardia Airport. The FAA is conducting the environmental review because the Port Authority plans to use the FAA Passenger Facility Charge Program to partially fund the project which makes the project subject to review under the National Environmental Policy Act, or NEPA. NEPA requires that a reasonable range of alternatives be identified and evaluated as part of the draft EIS process. For this project, a total of 47 unique alternatives were identified and screened to determine whether the alternatives exist that would reasonably satisfy the stated purpose and need. The FAA held two workshops in January of this year providing information on each of the alternatives, the evaluation process and criteria used by FAA to assess the alternatives, and the results of the alternative screening analysis. A two-step screening process was used to evaluate each of the 47 alternatives to determine which of them were reasonable and should be carried forward for detailed environmental impact analysis. Each alternative was first evaluated to determine whether it could achieve the project purpose and need and those that could were then screened to determine if they would be reasonable to construct and operate. As shown in the table, only one alternative, a fixed guideway alternative, meets the purpose and need and was considered to be reasonable to construct and operate. Although the no action alternative does not meet the stated purpose and need, it is required to be carried forward per federal regulations. The proposed action and the no action alternative are analyzed in detail in the draft EIS. The proposed action is an above ground elevated fixed guideway system that would have three stations, two on airport and one off airport. The proposed fixed guideway system would connect with the New York City Subway 7 line and the Long Island Railroad Port Washington branch at Mets Willits Point. At LaGuardia Airport, there would also be a passenger walkway system connecting the stations to the Central Hall, a parking garage connector, public transportation, and ground transportation facilities. The project would also include an APM, Operations Maintenance and Storage Facility, or OMSF, located in proximity to the Willits Point APM station, as well as three traction power substations located along the APM guideway, and a new consolidated Edison substation adjacent to the OMSF to provide electrical power to the APM system. The OMSF would also provide a total of approximately 1,000 parking spaces for airport, APM, and Metropolitan Transportation Authority, or MTA employees, as well as replacement city field parking located at the OMSF. Acquisition of temporary and permanent easements would also be required to facilitate construction and operation of the project. Connected actions include relocation of the Passerell Bridge, improvements to the Mets Willits Point LIRR station, including a new shuttle service, relocation of the World's Fair Marina facilities, temporary MTA bus storage and parking during construction of the OMSF, and temporary relocation of approximately 200 city field parking spaces temporarily displaced during construction. The draft EIS document has been posted on the project website at www.lgaaccesseis.com and is available for downloading. The draft EIS includes an executive summary five chapters and supporting appendices. The draft EIS assumes that construction of the proposed action would commence in 2021 and would be completed and the APM system would be operational in November 2025. However, for analysis purposes, 2026 was used as the opening year, even though the APM system is projected to be operational for some part of 2025. The draft EIS also evaluates conditions in 2031 five years after the proposed action would be fully operational. 
The FAA acknowledges the current impacts of the recent social response to the COVID-19 public health emergency and the resulting decline in aviation and transit travel demand. At this time, it is impossible to precisely predict future changes to projected ridership and impacts that may result from a COVID-19 public health emergency response of an unpredictable nature and unknown duration. The following environmental impact categories were evaluated in the draft EIS. Air quality, biological resources, including fish, wildlife, and plants, climate, coastal resources, DOT Section 4F resources, and Section 6F of the Land and Water Conservation Fund Act, hazardous materials, solid waste, and pollution prevention, historical, architectural, archeological, and cultural resources, land use, natural resources and energy supply, noise and noise compatible land use, socioeconomic environmental justice in children's environmental health and safety risks, visual effects, including light emissions, and water resources, including wetlands, floodplains, surface waters, and groundwater. As shown in the table, the FAA has determined that the proposed action would not have a significant impact related to air quality, biological resources, climate, coastal resources, Section 6F obligated properties, hazardous materials, solid waste and pollution prevention, land use, natural resources and energy supply, noise and vibration, socioeconomics and children's environmental health and safety risks, and water resources. However, the Port Authority has committed to incorporating mitigation measures to reduce potential effects to biological resources, coastal resources, hazardous materials, solid waste and pollution prevention, and water resources. Based on an analysis of the proposed action compared to the no action alternative, the FAA has determined that the proposed action would have a significant impact on the environment, specifically to Section 4F properties, historic properties, traffic, environmental justice populations, and visual effects. Department of Transportation Act Section 4F. The proposed action would result in a physical use of Section 4F properties in Flushing Meadows Corona Park, as well as historic properties located within the park. New York City Parks, as the owner of the Section 4F properties, has indicated that the introduction of the APM guideway along the Flushing Bay Promenade would significantly detract from the use and enjoyment of the promenade by park users because of its aesthetic effects. FAA has determined the impacts to DOT Section 4F properties are significant. A number of measures would be implemented by the Port Authority to reduce impacts to Section 4F properties, but impacts would remain significant. Historic, architectural, archeological, and cultural resources. The proposed action would result in an adverse effect to the Flushing Meadows Corona Park Historic District, including four of its contributing elements, the Passerelle Bridge, the pavilion on the Passerelle Bridge over the Long Island Railroad, the main gate entrance, and the Passerelle buildings at main entrance. Significant impacts to historic resources would be mitigated through a memorandum of agreement between the FAA the New York State Office of Parks, Recreation, and Historic Preservation, the Advisory Council on Historic Preservation, the Port Authority, and New York City Parks. A copy of the draft memorandum of agreement is included in Appendix K of the draft EIS. Noise, vibration, and noise compatible land use. Temporary noise impacts during construction would occur for 1,213 residential units, a community support facility, a new middle school currently under construction, and two parks within the East Elmhurst and North Corona neighborhoods. Mitigation measures to reduce impacts would be implemented to the maximum extent feasible, such as method of construction, acoustic blankets, and restrictions on the timing of certain construction activities. However, impacts from construction noise would remain. Annoyance vibration impacts during construction would occur for 136 residential and hotel units, in two parks within the East Elmhurst and North Corona neighborhoods. However, construction vibration impacts would not be significant. Moderate operational noise impacts would occur along the Long Island Railroad Port Washington branch west of the Willits Point area to 967 residences and hotel units along the above ground portions of existing Long Island Railroad tracks. However, the moderate operational noise impacts would occur along an existing rail line and would result in minimal noise increases. Socioeconomics, environmental justice, and children's environmental health and safety risks. For traffic, significant impacts to five intersections in Flushing Meadows Corona Park 
would be brought below significance levels with mitigation measures. For environmental justice, FAA has determined that there is not a low income environmental justice population present within the project study area, but that a minority environmental justice population is present within the project study area. The minority environmental justice population would be significantly impacted. During construction, this population would disproportionately experience high and adverse noise and vibration impacts. During operation, this population would disproportionately experience high and adverse impacts to DOT Section 4F properties and visual effects to residences overlooking the Grand Central Parkway. A number of measures, including college scholarships and inclusion of minority and women-owned business enterprises and construction contracts, would be implemented by the Port Authority to reduce impacts to the minority environmental justice population. However, effects would still be disproportionately high and adverse. Visual effects. Light emissions from operation of the APM as trains pass by residences overlooking the Grand Central Parkway would be significant. The proposed action would have a significant impact by partially obstructing and contrasting with views of Flushing Bay from approximately 93 residential units overlooking the Grand Central Parkway. Views would be obstructed by the elevated APM guideline. Mitigation measures, including best management practices and design guidelines for the major features of the proposed action would be implemented by the Port Authority to reduce visual effects. However, impacts would remain significant even with mitigation. To learn more about the results of the draft EIS, we encourage you to view the individual information stations that are available on the project website. Each station provides information related to different aspects of the LaGuardia Airport Access Improvement Project, including the NEPA process, EIS process, draft EIS overview, and each of the environmental resources studied. The draft EIS for the LaGuardia Access Improvement Project was published on August 21st, starting a 45-day public comment period that closes on October 5th. The FAA encourages all interested parties to provide formal comments on the draft EIS. Comments should be as specific and substantive as possible so that the FAA can consider and address them in the final EIS. If you have comments you would like to submit for FAA's consideration and for the public record on the draft EIS, there are five ways to submit comments. By email at comments at lgaaccesseis.com, on the website at www dot lgaaccesseis.com slash formal hyphen comment by mail to Mr. Andrew Brooks at the FAA Eastern Regional Office, 1 Aviation Plaza, Jamaica, New York, 11434. Orally by leaving a voicemail at 855-LGA-EIS-9 or 855-542-3479. Orally at the public hearings. Public hearings are scheduled to occur on September 22nd, 23rd, and 24th. To participate in the public hearings, please register for each event you plan to attend by visiting the registration page on the project website at lgaaccesseis.com. Registered participants will receive a confirmation email with instructions on how to join the virtual event, including an online webinar link and a call in phone number. Virtual events are also being broadcast via live stream on the FAA YouTube and Facebook Live accounts. Thank you for participating in our public workshop. Good morning and welcome to today's public workshop. My name is Bill Heisman, Executive Director of the Aviation Development Council, and I will be serving as your moderator. The purpose of this workshop is to provide information about the FAA's Environmental Impact Statement and attempt to answer questions from the public about the EIS. Mr. Brooks and Ms. Genet have provided an overview of the project and we will now move into the question and answer portion of today's workshop. 
Questions will be received by monitors through the question and answer tab within the Zoom window or via text to 301-531-5996. And by entering your question in the comments section on the FAA's YouTube and Facebook live streams. Questions will be answered by a panel of subject matter experts, and I will read questions to the panel in the order they are received. Due to the nature of the virtual meeting, dialogue between the public and the panel is limited to question and answer. The panel, the panel will make all efforts to respond to questions in detail. However, it may not be possible to respond to all questions during today's workshop. Narrated information stations for each environmental resource category can be found on the project website. The information stations provide a more detailed description of the draft EIS findings for each environmental resource. During this public meeting, we ask that the participants kindly refrain from using aggressive or discriminatory language, personal insults, insults, and obscenity when finalizing their question. The event organizer reserves the right to remove comments that violate these standards of conduct. Please note that questions and answers about the AIS during the workshops will not be included as part of the public record and public comments on the EIS will not be taken during these workshops. Formal comments on the EIS must be submitted during the public hearing or through one of the other comment methods described on the project page at www.lga accesseis.com. Those methods include an online submission form, email, voicemail, US mail, written comments, and comments left on the project hotline must be received by 5 p.m. Eastern Time on October 5th, 2020. With that said, I will now read the first question for our panelists. Question one is for Andrew Brooks. The question is, I know the updated NEPA regulations are still very new to everyone but I am wondering how you are adopting the process for this project. Thank you, Bill. Um, so the questioner is referring to the new Council on Environmental Quality regulations that were put into effect last Monday, September 14th. Um, this process was well underway by the time those regulations were promulgated, so it will continue under the uh, previous regulations. However, we are considering ways in which the new regulations can be adapted into the process moving forward. Uh, we're still working through that process right now, um, and we'll do what we can to address any required changes between now and the issuance of the final EIS and record of decision in the spring of next year. Thank you, Bill. Well, thank you, Andrew. Well, the next question is for Hirsch Parekh. And the question is, uh, will the construction uh, be guided by area standards for wages and benefits? Uh, thanks, Bill. So uh, this project will be uh, entirely union built. Uh, there will be a project labor agreement um, before construction begins, and that will guide um, all of the wages and things like that. I appreciate it, Hirsch. Uh, I'm waiting for my next question, and here it is. Uh, this question is for Steve Culberson. Uh, why not extend, extend the Astoria train, which would be cheaper? The number seven train is overcrowded. 
and here in Flushing, we have to stand on upper stairs until the next train arrives. Where are we going to put people on the crowded number seven train? Thanks, Bill. Uh, so we did look at uh, extending the Astoria uh, subway as part of the alternatives analysis. Uh, there were 47 alternatives that were examined. We had two sets of criteria, one based on purpose and need, and one based on operational and construction criteria. That each had a set of four criteria. Uh, all of the subway uh, extension alternatives, including the Astoria uh, train extension, passed purpose and need. And then when, when we looked at construction and operation uh, criteria, that is where this uh, particular alternative failed. Um, when uh, due to impacts to either um, existing interest, major infrastructure or to existing commuter lines. Um, and I don't know, if Dave Fool, if you wanted to add on to particulars for why this alternative failed. Dave, any comments? All right, if not, I'm gonna to move to uh, next question. It's for Hirsch Parekh. And the question is, uh, when will the Port Authority procurement documents be published and available for interested firms? Uh, thanks, Bill. So um, there is currently a uh, program briefing book that is available on the Port Authority's new LaGuardia website. That's www.anewlga.com. And the program briefing book can be found on the air train tab. In regards to next steps in the procurement, we have not decided on that timeline yet. However, the uh, contract for the project will not be awarded until after uh, the record of decision is issued uh, by the FAA. Thank you, Hirsch. Uh, the next question is directed to Andrew Brooks. And there's a, I believe it's a three part question. I'll ask it one, or one section at a time. First part, the draft EIS indicates that parking spaces lost during the project will be placed on land in the Willits Point Special District. Was this information disclosed in the 2019 scoping process? Thanks, Bill. Uh, so the need to relocate parking and temporary parking for the duration of construction was contained in the information provided out for the 2019 scoping process. All right, the next uh, part of the question is, does the current zoning in the Willits Point Special District allow for parking lots or parking garages? Uh, thanks again, Bill. So this is an issue um, that was recently raised in coordination with the city that were dis in discussion with the city um, department of planning and, and various other city agencies on right now. And we're uh, discussing that issue with them uh, currently. All right, and the last part of this question, will a rezoning be subject to the city's uniform land use and review process? Uh, so thanks again, Bill. Again, uh, we're in discussions with the city on, on a lot of these elements because this issue was just recently raised in the process of review and coordination. That certainly is one thing that is uh, being worked with the city agencies at this time. Um, any changes to the analysis that are needed to reflect this will likely be contained within the final EIS when it's issued in the uh, spring. Thank you. Thanks for the clarification. Uh, I'm gonna to move to the next question. This one is for Marie Genet. Will the FAA reconsider the need for the project given the reduced level of air traffic uh, during the COVID-19 pandemic? Right now, nobody knows what's going to happen uh, because of COVID-19. However, we are confident that air traffic in general will revert to the levels it was prior to the pandemic beginning as it did with September 11th and with the recession of early, 20, uh, early 2000s. Uh, thank you, Marie. Uh, the next question is directed to Hirsch Parekh. The question is, uh, is the funding in place for this project? Uh, so the LaGuardia Air Train project is part of the Port Authority's capital plan. Uh, we have every intention to completing 
um, the airport, LaGuardia Airport Redevelopment Program, of which an integral piece is the LaGuardia Air Train. Um, as has, as our leadership at the Port Authority has stated publicly, we intend to complete any construction projects um, uh, that are were already underway prior to COVID and prior to the impact on the Port Authority's finances, and that includes the LaGuardia Airport Program with the Air Train, um, pending the outcome of this environmental review, certainly as well as the um, Newark Terminal One Airport program with the Newark Air Train as well. Uh, thank you, Harsh. Uh, next question goes to uh, Steve Culberson. And the question is, what is the expected service frequency of the air train between LaGuardia and Willits Point? And what is the expected transfer time to the subway or the LIRR? So the service frequency of the air train between LaGuardia and Willits Point, they, um, during peak times, uh, it is expected to run approximately every four minutes. During uh, non-peak time overnight hours, it would run less frequently, um, but in general, about every four minutes. In terms of the transfer time, so there would be direct connections from the um, Long Island Railroad platform up to the air train platform. Um, so it would, you know, entail people getting off the train, getting onto the elevators and taking the elevator up to the air train or vice versa. Um, we expect that would be, you know, between three and five minutes, depending on party size and, and other um, factors. Uh, for the seven line, um, there would be, um, a connection outside of the, the platform to the seven line, uh, then they would have to go take vertical circulation up to the, the um, air train station uh, and walk a little distance to get to the train itself. Um, again, expect three to five minutes. Thank you, Steve. Next question is directed to Scott Noel and it's a two part, but I'm gonna read it all together. Uh, what is the difference between annoyance level vibrations and vibrations that exceed annoyance level? Second part is explain what the difference impacts to property and people may be between these two categories. Um, I think I follow the question. Um, so annoyance, um, annoyance level vibrations are those that don't um, that are noticeable but don't cause damage to a structure is, is one way to think about it. Um, there's two different property types that we've analyzed. Um, they're general land use categories, general property categories. Um, one is for where people sleep, residences and hotels, and the other is for, for um, predominantly daytime use areas. In this case, um, the impacts are at parks and they are slightly less sensitive um, per FTA criteria to construction vibration annoyance um, than residences because people dwell at residences for longer periods of time. Understood, Scott. Uh, next question is for Andrew Brooks. And the question is, uh, the build out for the air train occurred before the EIS. Doesn't, uh, doesn't that make this process really a fait accompli? Uh, thanks, Bill. So um, this has been an item uh, that we've gotten questioned on throughout the process. And, and to clarify, all the construction currently underway at LaGuardia is for previously approved projects related to terminal and roadway development. Um, they're not, none of the construction currently underway at LaGuardia is related to the air train. The air trains would, would construct stations to connect to those terminals, uh, but that is a separate and distinct project that is being analyzed in this environmental impact statement. All of the previous work uh, underway at LaGuardia was analyzed in environmental assessments that were carried out over the past few years uh, and subject to their own reviews and approvals. Uh, thank you. All right, Andrew. Uh, next question is for Marie Jeanne. Is access to the LaGuardia air train provided from Jamaica Long Island Railroad Station? Thanks, Bill. Uh, the short answer is that there will not be direct access from Jamaica. However, passengers arriving to Jamaica could go to Woodside and then go on the Port Washington line to get to the air train. Thanks, Marie. Our next question is uh, back to Andrew Brooks. 
in the future, will I be able to follow up on the adapted NEPA implementation based on the new CEQ guidelines? Since everything is so new, I am interested to see how your agency will make these changes, having recently operated under the old regulations. Uh, sure, thanks, Bill. So um, th this question actually expands a little bit beyond the project specific here, uh, but uh, I will just take a minute to, to speak to the question. Uh, our agency uh, is a unit of the United States Department of Transportation. Department of Transportation has NEPA implementing uh, order. Uh, it's DOT order 5610. Um, that order will need to be updated. Uh, once that order is updated, the FAA will update our NEPA implementing orders at 1050. The current version of that is 1050.1F. Uh, Airports Division also has a, a suborder of 5050.4B. Um, so all of those orders will are, are in the process of being updated, and that's the best way when those orders are issued. They'll go out in the Federal Register, and that'll be the best way to see how our agency and our department as a whole is updating to the new guidelines. Thank you, Bill. Appreciate it, Andrew. Uh, next question is for Steve Culberson. And it goes back to some of the capacity on the number seven train. Question is, uh, the Main Street uh, seven train is over capacity. Uh, will we have a double decker number seven train to handle this volume of people? Thanks, Bill. Um, so we did coordinate with New York City Transit MTA on the seven line in particular and the existing volumes of riders during the morning peak, midday peak, and the evening peak. We also looked at the forecasts that were prepared by FAA for this EIS, as well as the forecast prepared by the Port Authority. So when, when we look at the um, peak periods, um, so in the morning peak between, during morning rush hour, 6 a.m. to 10 a.m., um, there are projected to be um, be between, 375, about 375 riders to LaGuardia and 171 riders from LaGuardia during the morning peak. Um, and during the evening peak, 308 riders to LaGuardia and 522 riders from LaGuardia. So when we're looking at, you know, on an hourly basis at the relatively small number of projected ridership on the seven line uh, that would be connecting to the APM and based on the capacity numbers and the volume numbers that uh, New York City Transit provided to us uh, in consultation with them, they've stated that they have sufficient capacity to accommodate that, those numbers of riders. Oh, thank you, Steve. Uh, next question is uh, for Marie Jeunet. And the question is, uh, the pandemic has revealed the importance of outdoor space for health and safety. Why is parkland being taken at this time for this particular project? Thank you, Bill. Uh, all the different alternatives that were evaluated were screened on many different levels, one of which, of course, was the impacts to parkland. The proposed alternative is one that has a minimal impact to the parks and also minimum impact to residences. I appreciate it, uh, Marie. Uh, we have a question now for Steve Culberson. And the question has uh, two parts. I'm going to read them all together. Where? Uh, where near the Willits Point stop will the air train stop be exactly? And the second part, if nearer to the Long Island Railroad, what will be the walking distance from the number seven train in terms of feet or distance? I think you addressed this uh, a little bit prior. Right, so the proposed APM station would be above um, the Long Island Railroad platform and in between the seven line and the Port Washington branch. So the, the APM would come from LaGuardia, um, it would cross over the seven line, and then the station would be between the seven line and the Port Washington branch. There would be um, the vertical circulation from the seven line platform would go directly into the station. From the seven line, there would be uh, vertical circulation up into the APM station, and there would be a walkway um, for people to access the trains. 
In terms of the actual distance, I'm not entirely sure about that. Um, we would have to, uh, we will provide provide that if a written comment is, is uh, provided on the draft EIS. Uh, thanks, Steve. Mm -hmm. Our next uh, question is for David Full. And the question, David, is uh, why uh, isn't rapid bus transportation being considered? I don't know if David's Thank mic you. is yeah, on. Well, thanks. Um, Actually, we did uh, have a variety of alternatives that did look at uh, changes to bus routes, and that included um, some rapid uh, bus transit routes. Um, I would refer the questioner to uh, chapter two, um, which outlines all the various alternatives, and these are all the uh, alternative number four. Um, so there are a variety of different bus route alternatives that were considered uh, within the EIS. Thank you. Uh, thanks, David. Uh, next question is for Hirsch Parekh. Will all the incidental work outside of the project be a part of the PLA project labor agreement? So uh, I don't want to speak to the um, specifics of the PLA. It's something that is negotiated between the unions and the, uh, and the contractor. Um, but um, as I mentioned, this will be a project labor agreement uh, for this uh, project, um, which will be negotiated and agreed upon, agreed to before construction begins. Uh, thank you, Hirsch. Uh, the next question is for Andrew Brooks. And the question is, why isn't ferry service being considered? Thank you, Bill. Um, ferry service is one of the alternatives that was considered under uh, grouping three of alternatives in chapter two of the EIS. It looked at a previous uh, citywide ferry study recommendation and carried that forward that included ferry stops in uh, Brooklyn and Manhattan, providing service to LaGuardia, both to the Marine Air Terminal on the west side of the airport and to the uh, main terminal line on the east side of the airport. Um, so the, the service itself was considered not only in alternative three, but there was an alternative 9C that was a hybrid of the proposed action and a ferry service as well. Um, it was ruled out um, based on the fact that uh, you could not get time certainty for uh, the ferry passengers. Once they got to the airport themselves, they would need to get from the ferry landing to the uh, various terminals. And uh, that's where that uh, those alternatives um, failed the screening process. Um, I would encourage uh, the questioner to uh, review uh, chapter two of the EIS, which has more information on exactly why uh, the ferry was not brought forward for full analysis of environmental impact. Thank you, Bill. Well, thank you, Andrew. Our next question is for Marie Jeanet. Have there been other NEPA environmental impact studies done to evaluate access to LaGuardia? And if so, what was their outcome and how are they being considered under the current NEPA? Thanks, Bill. Uh, to my knowledge, there have been no other federal level NEPA EISs done to evaluate access to LaGuardia. However, the issue has been studied uh, for many, many years and we used a lot of that information in developing the alternatives. Thanks, Marie. Uh, next question goes back to Andrew Brooks. Was information about the MOU that the city of New York signed with the Port Authority about using land in the Willits Point Special District for parking prior to the scoping meetings explicitly disclo disclosed, I'm sorry, during the scoping meetings themselves? Thank you, Bill. Um, I, I mean, this is about the third question that we've got on, on this issue so far. So, I mean, the information that we had available that was made available to the FAA at the time that scoping occurred was made available to the community um, during the scoping process. Uh, we did not withhold anything uh, that we had, the scoping process that occurred from May to June of 2019, um, not just for this issue, but for every issue 
uh, that we had information on was provided and full disclosure of the uh, proposed action at the time that it was known was made available at that time. Uh, there have been further refinements to the design. We discussed further refinements to the design when we came out to the public in January. Um, that information was made available to folks to weigh in on and during the alternatives review process that we had in, in January of this year. Um, so I just want to be clear that all of the information that was made available to the FAA was made available to the public, both during the, the public outreach associated with scoping in May and June of 2019, as well as any ref project design refinements during January. Additionally, further project refinements have been discussed with the consulting party meeting process and all participants in that process that have expressed an interest in joining that process have been made aware of all of the information as the refinements have occurred throughout the process. Thank you. All right, Andrew, thank you for the clarification. Our next question is for David Full. And the question is, uh, shouldn't the alternatives be prevented, presented, sorry, in the DIS instead of being ruled out in the scoping analysis? Well, the, the FAA um, orders for implementing NEPA, uh, that would be the orders that Andrew talked about earlier, 1050.1F and 5050.4B, um, they, they require a thorough and objective assessment of uh, not only the proposed action and the no action alternative, but any other reasonable alternatives. And so our process then was to identify, well, what are the reasonable alternatives? And uh, we did identify 47 different alternatives that we took through a screening process to determine which ones were reasonable to include in the analysis. So that is, um, that is how that actually is done to determine what is considered to be reasonable and what needs to be analyzed at, a, um, at that level of detail within uh, the draft DIS. I appreciate it, uh, Dave. Uh, next question goes to uh, Steve Culberson. Uh, can you clarify or explain uh, on the employee parking and other required uses at the OMSF site? Yes, thanks, Bill. Um, so the operations, maintenance, and storage facility, uh, which would be constructed um, just south of the Seven Line Station, just south of Roosevelt Avenue, uh, Today, there is a commuter parking lot and there's also parking for MTA employees that utilize the Casey Stengel bus depot as well as the seven uh, Corona yard. So uh, during construction, that area would, those, that, those parking spaces would be displaced. There's about 200 spaces uh, that would be um, displaced from the commuter parking lot. And then the rest of the parking are MTA employees they would be shifted, the MTA employees would be shifted um, to the east. Uh, there is a temporary um, parking area that is part of the project that has been um, evaluated as part of the environmental effects of the project. And then for the commuter parking, uh, which is also used for METS parking and special event parking, there would be uh, temporary parking lots uh, east of METS City Field. In the OMSF itself, so once it is constructed, there would be about 500 spaces uh, for airport employee parking. Um, so 500 spaces that currently uh, are on LaGuardia Airport would be shifted to the OMSF, and there would be an additional 500 spaces. 200 would be for replacement parking for the parking displaced by the OMSF um, for the commuter lot and city field parking. And then another 250 spaces of that 500 would be replacement parking for MTA employees. And then the final 50 spaces would be for the actual APM operation staff, the people that would actually operate and maintain the APM system. I appreciate it, Steve. Uh, next question is directed towards uh, Marie Jeanne. And the question is, uh, will the air train station's vertical circulation include escalators, elevators, and stairs? Thank you, Bill. 
The exact way the vertical circulation will happen will be determined during design, but it is reasonable to assume it will have at least some combination of those, if not all three. Yes, Marie, thanks. Next question is for, uh, it mentions that it's for Steve Culberson, but um, maybe Hirsch Parekh may want to speak to this as well, but I'll let you as the panel decide. The question is, what community benefits is the uh, Port Authority considering as a result of this major detrimental impact on the recreational uses uh, of the uh, Flushing Bay area, including human powered boating? Uh, so I'll start off, Hirsch, and then I will let you, um, you know, uh, expand upon whatever I provide here. So in the EIS, we do um, contain a number of mitigation measures that uh, the Port Authority has um, proposed in terms of impacts to um, environmental justice populations and the local community. Um, that includes improving the um, Ditmars Boulevard entrances to the two pedestrian bridges that go over the Grand Central Parkway. Um, they would be working closely with um, city parks uh, to create a Flushing Bay Promenade Community Advisory Council um, to share information and solicit ongoing community input uh, to develop a plan uh, for the full scope and design of the improvements to the Flushing Bay Promenade. Uh, and those portions of the park, including the pedestrian bridges. Um, they are also looking at, uh, and I'll let uh, Hirsch go into more detail about um, college scholarships and, and WBE commitments. Um, and I think those are the primary mit mitigation measures uh, that have been identified to date, uh, Hirsch. Thanks, Steve. I would also just reiterate uh, what Maurice said previously that um, this uh, uh, alignment, this uh, access project um, has uh, minimal impact on, on parkland, um, but in terms of what we will be doing to ensure that um, we are improving and, and bringing a better park uh, access to the community, um, the, the EIS provides for a the formation of a Flushing Bay Promenade Community Advisory Council that will help both the Port Authority and New York City Parks um, design and, and, and implement um, improvements and enhancements to the promenade. Um, there are a number of other mitigations in place, such as college scholarships, a robust workforce development program, um, MWBE uh, contracting opportunities. Uh, I'm happy to go into more detail if the questioner would like uh, more information. Thank you. Appreciate it. Um, next question is for Marie Jeanet, and the question is, uh, what consideration was provided in the EIS to quantifying the economic benefits or detriments that would result from the LaGuardia Air Train project? Thanks, Bill. Uh, we did not do a cost-benefit analysis. Uh, that the, the quantification of the benefit or disbenefit would be more properly answered by Hirsch. Is Hirsch available? All right, I have to uh, re-click. Um, <laughs> so uh, yeah, so uh, we anticipate that there is a significant uh, economic benefit that will come from this project, um, as has been disclosed in the in the draft EIS. Uh, Three thousand construction jobs, more than one hundred permanent operations jobs, um, uh, and then the you know it's a two point oh five billion dollar project. So there is a 30% minority and women owned business enterprise goal with a heavy, heavy focus on local MWBEs to uh, uh, get contracts on this project. And then beyond that, the indirect benefits that will come from this project of the construction workers utilizing, uh, uh, patronizing businesses in the community, restaurants, grocery stores, et cetera. So there will be tremendous economic benefit um, that will come from the construction and operation of the air train to LaGuardia. Thank you, Hirsch. Uh, the next question is directed to Steve Culberson, and it also involves some questions already asked about the number seven train. So I'm going to ask this question. Uh, under normal non-COVID conditions, 
The number seven train is bursting at the seams with standing room only crowds during the extended morning and afternoon rush hours. It is shoulder to shoulder uh, and development in Flushing continues at a fast pace with still more residential towers being planned. Where will people with luggage fit on the train given these conditions and have the study leaders ridden the train during rush hours? Uh, so yes, I have ridden the seven line uh, during rush hour and I understand uh, the comment. Uh, there are certainly trains that are um, full to capacity. When we coordinated with uh, City Transit and we asked them for data on the ridership for the seven line, they provided um, the annual numbers and they provided peak hour um, volumes as well as their capacity. So during the morning peak, um, peak ridership is in Manhattan and the peak uh, load is at 40th Street with a volume of 13,440 passengers. Uh, but even at that, uh, but even during the morning peak, um, they still have 21% available capacity at the peak. That's for the local train, for the express train, there is, they are more crowded. They operate at 90% capacity, but they still have 10% uh, with a volume of 16,300. And we're looking at during that same peak period, 300 passengers uh, over a four hour period. So the additional numbers during those peaks in the, especially in the peak rider and the peak direction going into Manhattan uh, is relatively small on a, on the, during the peak hours. Um, and similarly in the evening peak, um, the Local trains have about 26% uh, capacity and the express trains have 16%. The actual, for the APM system, the peak ridership is actually in midday when there is more capacity on the seven line. Uh, so keep in mind that the ridership forecasts um, predict that most of the APM passengers will be taking the Port Washington line, which will have increased a shuttle service as part of this project. Uh, so while it will affect the seven line, it's not expected to be a significant impact. Oh, thank you, Steve. Uh, Steve, this question, the next question also uh, relates to um, this number seven train. And it's, uh, the question is, uh, so why are you building a billion dollar train for a hundred people to use uh, during rush hour? So again, th those numbers are for the seven line uh, for when you add in the seven line and the Port Washington shuttle service, uh, the numbers are quite a bit higher um, on a daily basis. Uh, when you look at, sorry, my, so we're looking at total, total daily annual uh, APM passengers about 17,000, uh, between 13,000 and 17,000 in 2026, and between roughly 14,000 and 18,000 in 2031. So um, although the numbers on the seven line are fairly small, we do expect significantly more riders on the uh, Long Island Railroad shuttle service. Thanks for the explanation, Steve. Um, next question is for Andrew Brooks, and it's about uh, language access. Uh, what arrangements are being made to provide translation and interpretation of materials and abil ability to meaning meaningfully participate in the languages of our communities? Uh, the, and the question states Spanish, Korean, and Chinese. Uh, thanks, Bill, great question. Um, so throughout the process, we have requested uh, folks, uh, if they need translation services for various information sharing throughout the process, please make us aware at our scoping meetings and our uh, alternatives workshop meetings that we had, uh, as I mentioned in a previous response uh, over the course of the project, we have had Spanish and Cantonese translators available. Uh, we solicited uh, during registration for 
the workshops and hearings this week for folks that needed translation services to make themselves available. Uh, last night, we had a, an American Sign Language interpreter live signing the hearing. Um, so we have repeatedly requested uh, input from the folks in the community uh, if needed to make us aware uh, of these services. Uh, in addition, we did get uh, one request for Spanish, Spanish translation during the consulting parties process that I mentioned again in a previous response. And we have made all of the consulting party documentation available to the public in English and, Sp and Spanish on the project website. Those documents are still hosted there. If translation services are still needed, uh, we would request that you submit uh, a request for translation of documentation to the website. Uh, the, there is a uh, email address on there. It's comments at lgaaccesseis.com, which, which is also the same uh, email address that you would use to submit written comments for the project. Uh, please make a request there and we will, uh, we will do what we can to honor the request. Thank you, Bill. Oh, thanks, Sandra. Uh, next question is for Steve Culberson. Uh, it asks, when will this project uh, schedule or when is the project scheduled to start? And it goes on to say we need it badly to alleviate traffic and congestion in the neighborhood. Uh, so if FAA uh, issues a favorable record of decision and the necessary permits are issued, um, the Port Authority plans to start construction um, towards the end of next year. Uh, construction would uh, extend into late 2025 and uh, uh, as currently planned would start operation towards the end of 2025. Thanks, Steve. Uh, Steve, this question is for you as well. And the question is, uh, will adequate walkways be supplied between air train terminal and the number seven line train? And the second part of the question, will customer information signs with train times and adequate lighting also be provided? So the proposed action does include walkways that connect the uh, seven line and the air, air train terminal together. Um, they would be sized sufficiently for the ridership, um, projected ridership. Uh, they will be, the stations also will be made secure um, with lighting and other features. I, the customer information signs with train times is a good question. Uh, we haven't asked that particular question of the Port Authority. I don't know if Hirsch knows the answer to that or not. It, it may be a design issue that they have not gotten to at this point. Sure. Um, so we are intensely focused on making the wayfinding as easy as possible. Um, the connection itself um, will be very seamless, but also making sure that there is sufficient signage um, and other information to make sure that the, the, um, the customer is, uh, has all the information they need to um, get to the airport or from the airport. Thank you, Hirsch. Uh, the next question actually is for Hirsch. And the question is, people of color make up 60% of the New York City's population. And so why is so little black or so little black and Latino businesses given so little business opportunity? So we uh, are fully committed to making sure that minority and women owned businesses have as much opportunity as possible at, at, during any of our projects, uh, whether it's this project, the LaGuardia Redevelopment Program or any of the other capital projects the Port Authority has underway or as part of our capital plan. We have a minimum of 30% MWBE utilization goal for all of our projects. And as I said, that's a minimum. We uh, strive to go well beyond that. And as an example, for the um, LaGuardia Redevelopment Program that's currently underway, to date, there have been more than $1.4 billion of contracts awarded to MWBEs um, with more than half a billion, five, more than $500 million awarded to businesses based in the borough of Queens. So it is, something that we are intensely focused on and will continue to focus on with this project. Appreciate that, Hirsch. Uh, the next question uh, goes to Steve Culberson and it, uh, the following, and the question is the following. 
Uh, would the Long Island Railroad and the number seven line have an enclosed walkway for days when we have inclement weather? Thanks, Bill. Uh, yes. So the um, vertical circulation from the seven line platform, I mean, sorry, from the Long Island Railroad platform into the air train station would be totally enclosed, as well as the walkway um, and vertical circulation up from the seven line uh, into the air train station that would be totally enclosed. Thanks, Steve. Mm -hmm. Steve, this, this goes back to a question that was asked a little while ago about the walking distance uh, from the number seven train to the air train. Uh, but the questioner is, is indicating that you didn't answer the question earlier and he's barely sure that the information ex uh, exists uh, from your research. So he's asking again. So I think it's about 800 feet um, but we would need to look at the drawings in more detail. We do have the information. I just don't know it off the top of my head. Um, again, if um, happy to provide that in part of written responses as part of the comments on the draft EIS. All right, terrific. Thank you, Steve. All right, the next question is for uh, Marie Jeanet. And the question is, please summarize the decision process that the FAA will undertake to arrive at the ROD. Sure, the ROD stands for Record of Decision and that is the final action that FAA would take or the action that FAA would take. The next steps are for right now, we're in the public comment period. The comment period closes on October 5th and then we will um, evaluate all the questions and comments that are raised during the comment process, address them and then work towards preparation of the final EIS and the record of decision, we hope to have the final EIS and the ROD issued in the spring of 2021. Uh, thank you, Marie. Uh, I'm awaiting for the next question. I just wanna remind uh, the participants uh, that you can uh, submit questions in various ways. As you know, you can go to the question and answer tab on the Zoom window, or you can text us at 301 Five three one five nine nine six, or you can enter your question in the comments section of the FAA's YouTube or Facebook uh, live streams. So you have some uh, ability now. Um, all right, what we're going to do, since we don't have any questions at the moment, uh, we will play one of the information stations uh, where you can see uh, resource information. Uh, and while we're doing that, you can enter questions into the Q&A tab. Air quality and climate. The U.S. Environmental Protection Agency, or U.S. EPA, has identified six principal pollutants that act as indicators of air quality, including carbon monoxide, nitrogen dioxide, ozone, particulate matter, sulfur dioxide, and lead. Areas where air pollution levels consistently stay below these standards are designated attainment. Areas where air pollution levels persistently exceed these standards are designated non-attainment. LaGuardia is located in Queens County, New York. Queens County is designated as a serious non-attainment area for the 2008 ozone standard. The county is designated as a maintenance area for carbon monoxide and fine particulate matter. Queens County is in attainment for all other criteria pollutants, as shown in the table. As Queens County is a designated non-attainment area, the proposed action must conform with the state's plan to attain and maintain national standards for air quality, also known as general conformity. Compliance with general conformity is achieved if the proposed action would not cause emissions that exceed de minimis levels defined for the criteria pollutants. Applicable general conformity de minimis pollutant emission thresholds for Queens County are shown in the table. Greenhouse gases of concern associated with the proposed action are primarily carbon dioxide, methane, and nitrous oxide. 
Criteria pollutant and greenhouse gas emission inventories were prepared for construction of the proposed action and for operational activities that would change under the proposed action as compared to the no action alternative. In order to estimate emissions, assumptions were made for each construction activity, including the type of construction equipment to be used, equipment operating time, estimates of required construction materials, and the number of employees anticipated to be on site. Construction equipment types and fugitive sources include off-road on-site equipment, on-road on-site equipment, on-road off-site equipment, fugitive dust, and fugitive volatile organic compounds, or VOCs, and marine and rail transport. Operational activities that would change under the proposed action were analyzed to determine how the proposed action would affect emissions. The proposed action would not result in a change to the number of flights, type of aircraft, or number of passengers at LGA. It would only change how passengers and employees access the airport. Therefore, the draft EIS analyzed changes in surface vehicle traffic patterns and numbers of trips that would occur because of the proposed action, as well as emissions from new stationary facilities. Emission inventories were prepared for each year of construction from 2021 through 2025, as presented in the table shown. Criteria pollutant emissions were compared against the general conformity de minimis thresholds to determine conformity with the state's plan. Annual construction-related emissions would be below the de minimis thresholds for all criteria pollutants. Therefore, a general conformity determination is not required and there would be no significant adverse air quality impacts. Construction of the proposed action would result in a temporary increase in greenhouse gas emissions. As shown in the second table, annual greenhouse gas emissions for construction of the proposed action would total approximately 34,300 metric tons of carbon monoxide equivalent during the peak year of construction activity in 2022. Changes in traffic patterns were determined through a traffic analysis and two ridership studies completed for the EIS. The ridership studies identify the percentage of air passenger and employee trips that may potentially shift from other travel modes at LGA to using the proposed APM. These two forecasts were used in the air quality analysis to assess a range of impacts based on the projected ridership. This shifted demand under either forecast would result in a reduction of on-airport roadway, curbside, and parking facility demand under the proposed action as compared to the no action alternative. The projected shift of air passengers using low occupancy vehicles to public transportation would reduce surface vehicle trips to and from the airport. The proposed action is projected to remove up to nearly 28 million annual vehicle miles traveled by the year 2031. In addition to removing surface vehicle trips, the proposed action would result in changes to surfic traffic patterns on roadways and intersections near the Willits Point area due to the shift of employee parking from lot P10 to the APM OMSF and parking structure the shift in passenger and employee drop-off pickup to the Willits Point APM station, and new trips for APM employees. New stationary combustion sources, including heating boilers and emergency generators, would be required for operation of the proposed action. Emissions from both mobile and stationary sources were included in the air quality and climate analyses. As shown in the tables, the operational incremental change in both criteria pollutant and greenhouse gas emissions would be negative for all pollutants in both years and for both forecasts, indicating a net overall reduction in emissions when comparing the proposed action to the no action alternative. Therefore, no adverse air quality or climate impacts are expected. Air quality impacts would not be significant and therefore no mitigation measures are required. However, the Port Authority is committed to best practices to reduce public health and environmental impacts during construction and operation of the proposed action as defined in the Port Authority's Sustainable Design Guidelines.
in accordance with these guidelines which the port authority would require adherence to as part of all construction contracts contractors would be required to use ultra low sulfur diesel fuel all off-road equipment would be required to be retrofitted with emission control devices using best available technologies and diesel power generators would be limited to situations where commercial electric power may not be readily available the port authority would also require that its contractor use a stepped schedule for tier three and tier four construction equipment in addition to the construction equipment requirements the port authority would monitor particulate matter for the duration of the construction throughout the construction areas all right it looks like we have uh, some more questions so i'm going to read the uh, next question that's available uh, this question is for andrew brooks and it is the following. Andrew Brooks stated that the FAA had disclosed all documents it had to the public prior to the scoping meeting. This indicates that they did not have the MOU between the city and the Port Authority regarding the parking at Willits Point. Why did the Port Authority choose not to disclose information about the MOU that the city of New York signed with the Port Authority about using land in the Willits Point Special District for parking to the FAA prior to the scoping meetings. Thank you, Bill. Uh, so if I said documents in my response before, um, I, I meant it was meant to have been information. Um, so all the information that we had, we made available, went into the scoping information I just verified on the uh, project website that the scoping information is reflective of the information that we had at the time the scoping was conducted. Um, I encourage this questioner to ask this comment, um, uh, write it in comment for a comment response. Uh, the representative we have from the Port Authority on to address questions was actually not employed by the Port Authority at the time of scoping. Um, so it is not, uh, I don't feel comfortable putting uh, Hirsch in the position of answering a question that he was not uh, party to um, employment with the agency at the time. So uh, please, if, if the questioner can provide this comment in a uh, written comment and we will address it in the final yes. Thank you, Bill. I appreciate that, Andrew. Uh, we do have another question uh, and it is for Hirsch Parekh. And the question is, uh, at the Jamaica Station Terminal, there are places to buy food and drinks as well as other concessions. Is that also being considered as part of the plan for customer convenience, uh, being that there are no stores in the area of the air, what will be the air train station? Uh, thanks, Bill. So we have not fully fleshed out the, the, the programming and, and what other amenities will be available within the air train station. Um, it is certainly something that uh, we will be considering to ensure there are um, amenities and, and retail and food and beverage options um, uh, for customers, but uh, I can't go into specifics at this time because we have not uh, gotten that far in the build out of the uh, interior of the station and the amenities that will be contained within it. Uh, understandable. I'm going to move on to the next question. Uh, that's for Steve uh, Culberson. And it says that you mentioned a Port Washington Long Island Railroad shuttle to the air train. Can you please explain this? Yes, thanks, Bill. So as part of the proposed action, um, the Long Island Railroad would be introducing shuttle service between the Mets Willits Point Long Island Railroad Station and Grand Central Terminal in Penn Station. They would be providing service every 15 minutes with up to four trains per hour in each direction. Um, there would be some modifications to the existing Metzwilts Point Station. Uh, first of all, it would become a full-time station. Right now it's an events only station. It would become a full-time station. Most trains that currently go through that station would stop at Metzwilts Point. Uh, the new shuttle service, uh, would occur during off-peak hours or reverse peak service 
and would provide an additional 25 eastbound shuttle trains from Manhattan and 23 westbound shuttle trains to Manhattan per day. Peak period, peak direction service would be provided by existing trains operating along the Port Washington branch. Uh, modifications to the station include um, new platforms uh, with two outside tracks, uh, as well as some back of the house um, and signals and other um, other <laughs> sort of uh, activity to yeah enhancements to support that that service. Thanks. Terrific. Uh, thank you, Steve. Uh, this is a two part question. The first part goes to Hirsch, so I'll ask that uh, first. It says, uh, faced with the Port Authority's reduced revenue from their tra transportation assets due to COVID-19, is the port considering private finance to implement this project? Thanks, Bill. Um, so as, as I mentioned previously, the AirTrain project is part of the Port Authority's current capital plan, um, as was mentioned in some of the introductory videos, um, an important uh, funding source for this project is the passenger facility charge. Um, at this time, uh, I'm not able to go into the breakdown of the funding, uh, other funding sources um, beyond that information. Uh, thank you, Hirsch. Uh, the second part of this question goes to Andrew Brooks, and it is, is funding considered in assessing the environmental impact of the air train? Oh, well, Thanks, Bill. Funding is actually the trigger for the entire environmental impact uh, because the Port Authority is uh, requesting use of the passenger facility charge funding. Um, that is what uh, initiated this entire process. Um, so in that regard, um, in a sense, yes, but the actual funding and the revenue streams in and of themselves, no. If, if the Port Authority modifies or changes their funding approach, it will not uh, modify the uh, approach to the environmental impact statement at this point. Thanks. Thanks for the clarification. Uh, next question is going to uh, Steve Culberson. Uh, the question is, were traffic related emissions during construction years considered and included, second part, would there be increases in emissions due to congestion during construction? So the construction emissions estimate did include all emissions associated with construction equipment, materials delivery, as well as construction workers traveling to and from the site. Um, so that, that was factored into the construction emissions calculations. In terms of um, congestion during construction, so there would be, during peak hours, there would be no closures of any major roadways, any um, impacts uh, or temporary closures would take place uh, during off-peak or overnight hours um, that would be necessary. Um, there are some during, you know, during construction of the APM guideway in particular, when they have to cross uh, roadways, there would be some temporary lane closures, but those would all be, be done during non-peak periods. Uh, thank you, Steve. Um, I'm just going to remind our participants that this workshop is for questions uh, and answers. It's not for public comments. All comments on the draft uh, in environmental impact statement should be submitted using the methods that we already described. So this is for questions only. Comments for the draft EIS should go on to the uh, website or using the other methods that Andrew had uh, expressed. Now, right now, I don't see any other questions, so I don't know if we're gonna go to another information station. Yeah, we are. We're gonna go to another information a st a a station so that uh, you can see some of those uh, videos. Draft EIS Overview. An Environmental Impact Statement, or EIS, is a detailed written statement that defines the purpose and need for a project, considers a range of reasonable alternatives, analyzes and evaluates the potential direct, indirect, and cumulative environmental impacts that may result from the proposed action, 
and identifies measures that may mitigate the effects of a proposed action. Federal agencies prepare an EIS if a proposed major federal action is determined to significantly affect the quality of the human environment. The FAA initiated the EIS process in May 2019 with the publication of the Notice of Intent to Prepare an EIS. Most recently in the process, a Notice of Availability of the Draft EIS was published in the Federal Register on August 21, 2020, which marks the beginning of the public comment period. The public comment period is 45 days and ends on October 5, 2020. The draft EIS document has been posted on the project website at www.lgiaccesseis.com and is available for downloading. The draft EIS includes an executive summary, five chapters, and 18 appendices. The purpose of the proposed action is to provide a time-certain transportation option that connects airport passengers and employees to and from LGA as travel times to and from the airport continue to increase and become more unpredictable. Additionally, this transportation option should ensure adequate parking for airport employees. The Port Authority is proposing the proposed action to address unpredictable and increasing travel times to and from LGA while also addressing space constraints for employee parking. Specifically, the proposed action would address increasing and unreliable travel times between LGA and key locations within New York City, limited passenger and employee access to and from LGA, which is primary via roadway access, traffic congestion on off airport roadways near the airport, which contributes to airport access travel times, and limited on airport options to provide adequate employee parking in areas for storage of equipment and materials for maintenance activities. 47 unique alternatives were identified and categorized into 10 groupings. The alternative groupings that were evaluated are no action alternative, diversion of air traffic from LGA, use of other modes of transportation to LGA, transportation systems management, transportation demand management, emerging transportation technologies, off airport roadway expansion, subway extension, fixed guideway, and rail. A two-step screening process was used to evaluate each of the 47 potential alternatives to determine which of them are reasonable and should be carried forward for detailed environmental impact analysis. Each alternative was evaluated to determine whether it could achieve the purpose and need. Each alternative that met all elements of the purpose and need was moved to step two of the screening process to determine whether or not it would be reasonable to construct and operate. As shown in the table, only one alternative, a fixed guideway alternative, met both the purpose and need and was considered to be reasonable to construct and operate. Although the no action alternative does not meet the purpose and need criteria, it is required to be carried forward per federal regulations. The proposed action and the no action alternative are analyzed in detail in the EIS. The FAA has identified the proposed action as its preferred alternative. The agency's preferred alternative, as defined by CEQ, is the alternative which the agency believes would fulfill its statutory mission and responsibilities, giving consideration to economic, environmental, technical, and other factors. However, the FAA will issue a final decision on the project to be included in a record of decision only after FAA has had the opportunity to review public and agency comments on the draft EIS. Two study areas. All right, I believe uh, the video has paused and we're back with a question. So let me uh, take a quick look and get that question to you. One moment. Bear with me.
for some reason I'm not uh, seeing that question. Here it is, one moment. All right, I do have the question now in front of me. I apologize uh, for the delay. Uh, this question starts out uh, asking uh, or for a response from Hirsch Parekh. Here's the question. What is the estimated cost of running dedicated shuttles from the air train to Midtown via the Port Washington line? If the current MTA budget shortfall prevents them from running all the service, services they currently provide and those they plan to add after Eastside access, will they run the service at the expense of other types of service that serve more passengers and working residents of the city? Thanks, Bill. So um, the MTA has been really a great partners to us on this project. Um, the Long Island Railroad connection from um, Penn Station and Grand Central to Willits Point is an important component of the, the, the project and the, uh, the reliable, uh, certain uh, predictable ride that we have been uh, talking about. Um, regarding um, uh, the service and what they can or cannot provide, um, all of this is uh, with uh, the opening of East Side Access in a couple of years. and. Uh, our understanding is that is continuing. We have not been informed otherwise. Um, so uh, we anticipate that the MTA will be able to uh, provide that service and uh, we will take it from there. Terrific. Uh, thank you, Hirsch. Uh, the next part of that question is addressed to Andrew Brooks. And the question is, is the Port Authority legally able to run the shuttle on the Long Island Railroad line with money it will soon be allowed to collect via the passenger facility charges? Uh, thank you, Bill. So um, the operation uh, of the air train system and the operation of any supporting service uh, would not be eligible for passenger facility charge fees. The passenger facility charge fee would be collected and used solely for the construction of the uh, the proposed project should the FAA uh, approve this in a record of decision. Thank you, Andrew. Appreciate it. Uh, I have another question for Andrew, though. And the question is, is Long Island Railroad shuttle service from Willits Point to be provided to both Penn Station and Grand Central on completion of the East Side Access project? Uh, thank you, Bill. Um, Yes, that is the intention of the service. Um, it should come one per hour from each. Thank you, Andrew. Additional stop at Woodside. Thank you again. Thank um, you. I'm gonna to go to Steve Culverson if I can. And the question is, uh, what consideration was given to sea level rise uh, slash climate change? So we did, thanks Bill, we did look at um, the proposed project in relation to the existing floodplains and the coastal zone. It is um, largely proposed to be constructed within the floodplain and the coastal zone. Um, and we did look at uh, the design of the project, uh, its potential to um, be susceptible to uh, natural, you know, flooding slash sea, le sea level rise. And because it is an elevated train um, that would be on concrete columns, um, the design of the project would actually meet resiliency requirements. Um, all of the stations would be elevated, everything would be elevated so that they would, it would be less susceptible to uh, sea level rise or flooding events. Uh, thank you, Steve. Steve, the next question is addressed to you as well. Um, and the question is, uh, during the US Open or uh, Met Home Games, the Long Island Railroad Port Washington trains are also packed uh, like uh, cans of tuna is the description. Uh, the trains are every 30 minutes. 
how will you improve the Long Island Railroad to Port Washington uh, once the air train is completed? Uh, so as stated before, the uh, Long Island Railroad would be providing additional shuttle service. Um, so there would be an increase in capacity uh, with the shuttle service between Manhattan and the Mets Willits Point Station. Thanks again, Steve. Uh, the next question goes to uh, Marie Jeanet. And the question is, uh, during the US Open and Met Games, there is no parking. The plan calls for use of parking at that location. Where are you going to put all these cars during these game times? I can't speak to the cars uh, during those events, but what I can tell you is that all the existing parking, will the number of spots that currently exist will remain at the end of the construction of this project. There's no net loss of parking. Uh, thanks, Marie. Our next question will be directed to Hirsch Parekh. Is there a breakdown available of what connected actions will be performed as part of the AirTrain DBOM contract versus those that will be procured separately? Uh, I don't have the specific breakdown of what will be part of the contract. However, the connected actions that were described um, at the beginning of this um, workshop, um, including the passerelle uh, reconstruction at Willits Point and some of the work uh, to the uh, New York City Parks facilities along the promenade um, uh, may, may be part of that contract, but I would ask the, uh, the questioner to submit that as a comment for further, uh, for further clarification. I appreciate that, Hirsch. Thank you. Uh, next question is directed to uh, Steve Culberson. What is the av average amount of time that is projected to be saved by travelers from Grand Central using the number seven train to connect to a Willits Point air train to get to the LaGuardia Central Terminal or Terminal B in comparison to the time it would take to ride the number seven train from Grand Central to 61st Street or 74th Street stations and connect to the Q70 bus during the following times. I'll ask you the first time frame. The first time frame he's asking about or she is weekday morning rush hour. So I don't have that information right at my fingertips. Um, sure. So I would highly recommend that the commenter submit that comment in writing and we can respond to that as part of the final EIS. Fair enough, fair enough. Um, now, I do not have another question uh, before me, but I would remind everybody that it is now 12.38. Uh, the scheduled time for this workshop is until 1 p.m. So if you have any other questions, if you're participating and you haven't heard them and you want to get that question submitted and asked, uh, please go to the Q&A uh, portion of the website uh, for this workshop and submit them or the other forms by text or through the live streams. I think while we're waiting for questions, we're gonna go back uh, to the uh, video that we were viewing. Two study areas were defined for the purposes of assessing the potential direct and indirect effects of the proposed action and the no action alternative on environmental resources. The direct study area was identified as the limit of physical ground disturbance for components of the proposed action, including connected actions, in order to assess potential effects on environmental resources associated with construction. The general study area was defined to encompass the overall area containing all components of the proposed action in order to assess potential operational effects of the proposed action on environmental resources. In order to fully assess the effects associated with construction and operation of the proposed action, the analyses of some resources require a larger study area extending beyond the study areas defined above. These resources include air quality and climate, noise and vibration, socioeconomics, environmental justice, and surface transportation and traffic. 
The baseline year to assess existing environmental conditions is 2018, the last full year for which data were available at the time this analysis was initiated. However, more current data were used for resources when available or collected through field surveys. The assumed construction schedule indicates the proposed action would be completed and the APM system would be operational in November 2025. Many resource categories require the results of analyses to be presented in full calendar year increments. Thus, 2026 was selected as the opening analysis year even though the APM system is projected to be operational for some part of 2025. The EIS also evaluates 2031 conditions, five years after the proposed action would be fully operational. Two studies were completed for the proposed action in order to assess potential ridership of the proposed APM. The first ridership study was prepared by the Port Authority in October 2018 for future years 2025 and 2045. A second ridership study was prepared by the FAA's consultant team for the EIS to provide an independent analysis. Both studies identify the percentage of trips and annual passengers that may potentially shift from other current means of accessing LGA, also known as travel modes, to using the proposed APM. These two forecasts were used throughout the EIS to assess a range of impacts based on the projected ridership. The ridership forecast prepared for the EIS, which was finalized in August 2020, included development of an independent forecast for future years 2026 and 2031, corresponding to the future analysis years. The FAA's consultant team for the EIS interpolated the Port Authority's forecasts to provide comparable ridership numbers for 2026 and 2031. As shown in the table, it is estimated that total annual APM passengers would be between approximately 4.8 and 6.2 million in 2026 and between approximately 5.1 and 6.7 million in 2031. The Port Authority's ridership forecast also included estimates for interterminal ridership. However, the FAA forecast did not consider interterminal ridership, so to be consistent, interterminal rides, which are essentially passengers that never leave the airport, were also excluded from the Port Authority's ridership numbers presented in the table. FAA acknowledges the current impacts of the recent social response to the COVID-19 public health emergency and the resulting decline in aviation and transit travel demand. At this time, it is impossible to precisely predict future changes to projected ridership and impacts that may result from a COVID-19 public health emergency response of an unpredictable nature and unknown duration. The proposed action is planned to commence construction in 2021 and will require under five years to complete. The future ridership analysis presented in the draft EIS represents a reasonable indication of APM market potential based on pre-COVID-19 aviation and transit travel demand, LGA ground access, and regional land use patterns that can still reasonably be expected to occur as the economy recovers. FAA identifies 14 environmental impact categories that should be evaluated if present within the project area. The following environmental impact categories were evaluated as part of the draft EIS. Air quality, biological resources including fish, wildlife, and plants. Climate, coastal resources, DOT Section 4F and Section 6S of the Land and Water Conservation Fund Act hazardous materials, solid waste, and pollution prevention, historical, architectural, archaeological, and cultural resources, land use, natural resources, and energy supply, noise and noise-compatible land use, socioeconomics, environmental justice, and children's environmental health and safety risks, visual effects including light emissions, and water resources including wetlands, floodplains, surface waters, and groundwater. Farmlands and wild and scenic rivers are not present within Environmental Justice Executive Order 12898 Federal Actions to Address Environmental Justice in Minority Populations and Low Income Populations ensures the fair treatment and meaningful involvement of all people, regardless of race, color, national origin, or income, with respect to development, implementation, and enforcement of environmental laws, regulations, and policies. 
environmental justice reviews consider whether minority and low-income populations are present in a project study area, and if so, the potential effect of a proposed action on these populations. Income levels within the general study area and extended study area are generally consistent with those across New York and Queens counties, New York City, and the state. Therefore, no low-income environmental justice populations were identified within the study area. However, the general study area, shown in gold, and the extended study area, shown in purple, support a higher percentage of minority populations as compared to the full populations of the City of New York and New York and Queens counties. Furthermore, the general study area has a higher minority population when compared to the extended study area due to the comparatively higher minority population within both the general study area and the extended study area they can each be categorized as a minority environmental justice population environmental justice impacts were evaluated by determining whether the proposed action would have disproportionately high and adverse human health or environmental effects that are predominantly borne by minority populations during construction the proposed action would result in disproportionate effects to environmental justice populations for air quality, coastal resources, DOT Section 4F properties, hazardous materials, solid waste and pollution prevention, noise and vibration, socioeconomics and children's environmental health and safety risks, and visual effects. Construction activities associated with the proposed action would result in temporary noise impacts to approximately 1,213 residential units within the East Elmhurst and North Corona neighborhoods, as well as a service facility, a new middle school currently under construction, Hinton Park, and in limited areas within Flushing Meadows Corona Park. Vibration levels have the potential for vibration-related annoyance impacts to approximately 136 residential units. Thus, Minority environmental justice populations would bear disproportionately high and adverse noise and vibration impacts during construction. Operation of the proposed action would result in disproportionate effects to environmental justice populations for coastal resources, DOT Section 4F properties, historic, archaeological, architectural, and cultural resources, noise, vibration, and compatible land use, and visual effects. Of these, environmental justice populations would experience disproportionately high and adverse effects due to Section 4F and visual impacts. Mitigation measures would minimize these effects to the extent practicable, but effects would still be disproportionately high and adverse. Therefore, operation of the proposed action would result in a significant impact to environmental justice populations. In determining whether a mitigation measure or an alternative is practicable, the social, economic, including cost, and environmental effects of avoiding or mitigating the adverse effects are considered. For the proposed action, an analysis of the vertical profile of the APM guideway along Flushing Bay Promenade was undertaken to determine if lowering or raising the guideway would avoid or mitigate the adverse visual impacts to environmental justice populations. FAA determined that lowering of the APM guideway would not avoid or mitigate the adverse visual impacts to the environmental justice populations and would increase impacts to other resources, while raising the APM guideway would increase the adverse visual impacts to a larger proportion of the environmental justice population without reducing the adverse visual impacts associated with the proposed action. Mitigation measures the Port Authority would implement include Improving the Ditmars Boulevard entrances to the two pedestrian bridges over the Grand Central Parkway. Creating a Flushing Bay Promenade Community Advisory Council to work in collaboration with the Port Authority and NYC Parks to share information and solicit ongoing community input in developing a plan to determine the scope and design for improvements to the Flushing Bay Promenade and the Ditmars Boulevard entrances to the two pedestrian bridges over the Grand Central Parkway. Undertaking efforts to go beyond its current policies for inclusion of minority and women-owned business enterprises, focusing on using as many local firms as possible for construction contracts, and funding college scholarships 
for Queens residents residing in the vicinity of LaGuardia by developing a scholarship program tailored to the local community and construction and operational needs of the proposed action. Okay, I believe that video is, is done and we're back uh, live with some questions. Uh, this question is for Andrew Brooks. And the question is, are all residential homes affected by the construction? That's 90 plus homes alongside the Grand Central outlined in the draft EIS. I saw landmark properties outline, but no others. If so, could you direct me where this information can be found? Um, sure, and I, I think if possible, we may have a slide that we could share that actually depicts this um, in response to this question. Um, but essentially, the, the it's not exactly 90 residential homes, it's, it's housing units as some of those structures have more than one unit um, occupancy in them. Uh, the majority of them are along the bluff that abuts the, um, the Grand Central Parkway there just to the, the south and the west of, of the Grand Central. Uh, this information um, in terms of noise is uh, it's located in the noise analysis section in chapter three. On-site construction is evaluated by determining the noise levels generated by different types. You can see on the, uh, I, I guess we went to the video here, but you, you can see on the graphic attached here um, and being shared now um, that the- Following the procedures. Color, FDA manual, um, are there. Noise. So I'll, I'll ask if we could just stop sharing the screen, thank you. Um, but th those, those figures are in chapter three, uh, specifically the noise subsection. Um, additionally, what was just brought up was the information station that pertains to noise that's available on the website by clicking the draft EIS button and, and then navigating to information stations. Thank you, Bill. Uh, thanks, Andrew. Uh, I do have another question. Uh, this one is for Mindy. And the question is, uh, the draft EIS will its point land? says that the land at Willits Point may emit vapors that are, that are harmful to human breathing. Why is this land being considered for a parking lot if it is suspected of being somewhat or heavily contaminated? Thanks, Bill. So we performed phase one environmental site assessments of this area and we did determine that there was a potential for vapor contaminants to be an issue, but because there are not going to be any enclosed structures as part of the parking facility, we did not deem that there was any risk to human health. And if there were, if plans did change and we were going to propose some enclosed structures, then a vapor investigation would be conducted to evaluate the issue. Thank you, Mindy, appreciate uh, your response. Uh, Bill, uh, Bill, can I? Sure, absolutely. To that. Um, I, I believe the, the questioner is also re, re asking about the temporary lots um, uh, to the uh, east of 126th Street. I do want to stress that there's no ground disturbance associated with construction. Uh, there would be some uh, aggregate laid potentially for the temporary use. That's what's proposed. Uh, and then to reiterate, as Mindy said, there's no enclosed uh, structure proposed for the temporary use of those parking areas. Thank you. I appreciate uh, that clarification, Andrew. Uh, we have no more uh, pending questions at the moment. Just to remind everyone, we apologize for going back and forth uh, between the video and the uh, live workshop, uh, but uh, we do want to remind everybody that the information stations uh, that were shown can be found on the project, uh, project website, as well as many other uh, information stations. Uh, in addition, it's uh, currently just to remind you of this workshop, uh, this, it is 12.54. Uh, if we have no questions, uh, we will plan to uh, close the workshop at one o'clock. Um, 
do we have any more questions or would you like to uh, play another information station? I think we're gonna transition to an information station and then I would have some closing uh, remarks. I think we're planning to transition fairly quickly. Otherwise you're gonna be looking at my face a lot longer than you need to. And here we go. Thank you very much. Public involvement is being conducted in accordance with the provisions of the National Environmental Policy Act, or NEPA, and the Council on Environmental Quality Implementing Regulations, for NEPA. Accordingly, the FAA must provide pertinent information to the public, affected communities, and agencies, and consider their comments during preparation of the EIS. Comments received during public review of the draft NEPA document on the potential impacts of the proposed action and any reasonable alternatives identified must be considered. A public and agency consultation process was employed throughout the preparation of this draft EIS. The FAA considered all comments received as part of the consultation process and has incorporated comments as appropriate into the development of the draft EIS. Coordination and public notification efforts included the following. Pre-scoping, notice of intent, Native American and tribal consultation, scoping, elected officials briefing, community leaders meetings, consulting parties meetings, public information sessions. The public comment period on the draft EIS started on August 21, 2020 and ends on October 5, 2020. During the week of September 21st, the FAA will hold two virtual public workshops and three virtual public hearings. Registration and instructions for the public workshops and hearings are available on the project website at www.lgaaccesseis.com. The virtual events will also be broadcast via live stream on the FAA YouTube and Facebook Live accounts. Two public workshops will be held virtually via Zoom on September 22, 2020 from 4.30 to 6.30 p.m and on September 23, 2020, from 11 a.m. to 1 p.m. The public workshops will provide an overview of the project and draft EIS, followed by a moderated question and answer session. Three public hearings will be held virtually via Zoom on September 22, 2020, from 7 to 9 p.m., September 23, 2020, from 2 p.m. to 4 p.m., and September 24, 2020, from 5 to 7 p.m. Speakers who register to give oral comments will be given up to three minutes to allow everyone the opportunity to provide oral comments. All right, I believe we're back. Uh, we do have another question. The question is for David Full. And the question is, why were the dedicated bus lanes eliminated for further consideration for not providing a time certain transportation option while the air train's reliance on the number seven train and Port Washington lines were not eliminated for the same reasons. The, uh, the bus routes that, uh, that we looked at, uh, primarily the, uh, the Q48 um, modifying that bus route, the Q23 modifying that bus route, um, even calling those dedicated bus lanes, they still would use city streets uh, and still would be subject to what happens on city streets. And that includes uh, congestion, double park vehicles, traffic signals, uh, that sort of thing. So there is no real time certainty with respect to uh, the, that bus service. With respect to the seven uh, line and the Port Washington line, those do run on specific schedules and have dedicated lines associated with them. So they do have time certainty associated with the operation uh, of those systems. Uh, appreciate uh, that response, Dave. And uh, just to let everybody, all the participants know, it is uh, 1 p.m. Uh, maybe we'll wait just a minute to see if we get another question. Right now, we don't have any more questions. So um, if I don't receive a question very shortly, 
I have some closing comments in order to close uh, this workshop. I'll just wait uh, a few more moments to see if we do receive another question. All right, we don't have another question, so I'm going to move to uh, close the meeting. It is now a um, little after one o'clock. Uh, this concludes this public workshop on the draft environmental impact statement for the LaGuardia Airport Access Improvement Project. If your question was not answered during today's workshop, the narrated information stations for each environmental resource um, can be found on the project website. The information stations provide a more detailed description of the draft EIS findings for each environmental resource, recordings of today's public workshop, and the workshop held yesterday will be posted on the project website at www.lgaaccesseis.com. Please remember that questions and answers about the EIS during these workshops will not be included as a part of the public record. Formal comments on the EIS must be submitted during the public hearing. There is one that is following this meeting at two o'clock this afternoon or through one of the other comment methods described on the project web page which I mentioned is www.lgaaccesseis.com. Those methods include an online submission form, email, voicemail, and US mail. Written comments and comments left on the project hotline must be received by 5 p.m. on October 5th 2020. This concludes our workshop and I thank all of you for your participation. Thank you.